Uh, hello, everyone. Thanks for coming. I'm Krzysztof Kotowicz. This is Mike Samuel. We work at Google uh, in the hardening team, which the mission of which is to make writing code hard. Well, actually making writing vulnerable code hard, or making it the default case or the easy case to write the secure one. So that's a pretty nice wish mission. Uh, and we're doing that for a couple of years now. So we have quite a bit of experience of trying to secure large code bases that with a relatively small amount of security people. Today, we want to talk to you about one of the most prevalent problems that we have for uh, Google software, at least in the terms of web security, which is DOM-based XSS. We were thinking long for how to protect our applications against XSS in general and DOM XSS in specific as it suddenly becomes the most prevalent variant of it or most difficult to address. And we think we have a solution that seems to be good enough and worthy of implementation and adoption in not just Google software but in the web, web platform, in the browsers in general. And this is exactly what we will talk to you about, and this, it's called trusted types. And with that, I will hand over to Mike to describe you a little bit of the solution. Later on, I will present a demo, because you know, a picture is worth a thousand words. A demo is usually a recipe for disaster, especially the live demo. So let's try that. Thanks. As you can see, yeah, it's <laughs> always a bad idea to. Ah, this was tried. Okay, maybe like this. Yes. Ah, wonderful. So, uh, DOM XSS is actually, if you saw Lucas's talk earlier, it's. Uh, Google's single largest uh, security problem right now. And uh, the reasons are twofold. One, it's easy to introduce. It's very easy for a developer to uh, write an assignment to inner HTML uh, such that the value assigned is controlled by an attacker. Um, and it's really hard to detect. Automated scanners and code reviewers don't do well when that assignment to inner HTML happens deep inside the guts of some client-side framework. Um, and so, uh, we'd like a comprehensive solution. Um, uh, these are our goals. Um, uh, I hope to convince you that we can actually achieve these. Uh, so we'd like to fix the root cause. The root cause is that we have these browser APIs, and when an attacker-controlled string reaches them, bad things happen. Um, we want to uh, help developers. So. Uh, you know, we need to guide developers towards uh, safe abstractions and away from ad hoc methods for creating strings of HTML, CSS, and other micro languages that, uh, that these DOM APIs consume. And we need to simplify reviews. There's simply no way a small security team is going to be able to review all the changes made by a large uh, group of developers. So we need to, uh, we need a mechanism that makes Thank you. We need a mechanism that makes uh, interactions between uh, developers and security specialists uh, efficient and effective. And uh, there's a huge install base of applications out there, so we need something that works for existing applications. So um, I'd like to, uh, you know, uh, we've been doing this for server-side XSS for a while, and I, I'm going to kind of walk you through the uh, claim that we want to be to build confidence in. So uh, we're secure against DOM XSS because uh, reasons. Um, so what trusted types gives you is uh, if you've got a, if, if the uh, code is running on a browser that supports trusted types or you've loaded the trusted types polyfill, um, then you can opt into trusted types by tweaking a CSP header. So uh, you can see here that uh, uh, the content security policy header has this new clause, which is trusted types. Um, if all you do to your application is enable trusted types, you're going to break your application. But uh, it's instructive to see how it breaks. So uh, with trusted types enabled, uh, DOM syncs only accept trusted values. 
So a DOM sync is any browser API like uh, inner HTML or source that we need to keep attacker controlled strings away from. And trusted types guards these syncs, which means that you can't assign untrusted values uh, to these syncs when trusted types is enabled. So uh, with trusted types enabled, this assignment to inner HTML fails. Um, the payload string uh, simply doesn't get assigned. Um, down here, you can see that I'm using something called the trust types policy to create a trusted HTML value which can be assigned. So this may seem like a trivial change in semantics, uh, but it actually has far-reaching effects that I'll explain. Um, first though, uh, there's an awful lot of syncs, uh, more than 60. Um, and so we created a number of different trusted types. So trusted HTML is for syncs that take uh, strings of HTML, like inner HTML. Uh, trusted script is for JavaScript. A trusted script URL is for a URL that, when loaded, might uh, load code into the application. So a sourced script, for example. And trusted URL is for other URLs, link targets, images, uh, video, audio, that kind of thing. Um, so uh, if the only thing we did was prevent string assignment, that wouldn't help much. Some JavaScript developer with a deadline is so simply going to create a policy and use it to unwisely mark strings as trusted. So the first thing we realized we needed to do was we need to restrict policy creation. So. Um, you can see uh, here my header, uh, trusted types, uh, is followed by this name, HTML sanitizer. This is actually a policy name, and so following trusted types is a policy whitelist. Um, if you control the, this portion of the uh, CSP header, you control which policies can be created. And since all trusted values are created by uh, policies, uh, you effectively control uh, which trusted values can be created. So down here in the JavaScript, you can see we're defining a policy. So um, this policy uh, can be used to create trusted HTML, um, but the HTML that it produces is always going to be the result of an HTML sanitizer. So uh, it, uh, the HTML sanitizer will have removed any uh, powerful elements or attributes before, uh, before they become the content of this trusted HTML value. Um, and so uh, maybe there's some code deep in a dependency of a dependency of a dependency that thinks it's a good idea to convert Markdown to HTML without sanitizing anything. So since this name, sketchy Markdown to HTML, does not appear in our policy whitelist, this policy will never be created, and so will not be a source of uh, trusted HTML values. Um, and uh, what this means is, uh, so uh, policy code is actually the weak weakest link in this whole scheme. Policy code needs to be reviewed thoroughly. Um, if you unwisely mark values as trusted, then they can make it through to sinks, and uh, mayhem can ensue. So. Uh, but this is a much better situation than having to review all the policy code, uh, the, all of the application code produced by a large, large application development group. So once you've convinced yourself that the, uh, that the code that affects the results of a policy is legit, uh, your job is done. You, this, this allows you, uh, by controlling the whitelist, you can bound the amount of code that you as a security practitioner need to review uh, to be safe against uh, DOM XSS. Um, and what we found, we've been doing this for about six years now for server-side XSS, um, and what we found is that a, a, a small number of tools account for the vast majority of policy code. So for example, a strict template system automatically chooses escapers for untrusted values. So the less than script greater than is escaped when it's interpolated. Um, uh, it's an, uh, uh, a strict template system 
uh, is a good producer of trusted HTML values. Um, and it could, in fact, also be a consumer. So if an interpolation was a trusted HTML value, then it can avoid uh, uh, re-escaping that. Um, uh, sanitizers are another example of a tool. A sanitizer takes in an, in an untrusted string in a language and produces a string in that language without high-privilege ins instructions. So it's another uh, example of a good uh, uh, producer of trusted values. And uh, uh, builder APIs uh, can also be uh, good for good ways to create uh, trusted values. And, and these uh, tools like these count for the vast majority of policy code. Uh, what this means in the end is that uh, for most projects, you don't actually end up reviewing custom policy code. Um, and since developers have to uh, create trusted HTML values to, to use within your HTML or trusted URLs to use as link targets and the like, this, this guides them, to, uh, the, the trusted types kind of guides them towards secure abstractions and away from ad hoc methods. Um, so finally, there are some classes of strings that are almost universally considered okay. Uh, it's a big pain to migrate a large application when the majority of what you're doing is saying, oh, it's okay to, to allow this to assign this to a link target because it's an HTTP URL. The default policy uh, mechanism allows you to uh, uh, easily migrate applications that, that have this property where the vast majority of uh, strings fall into a bucket because of some recognizable property. So uh, here you can see that I've whitelisted a policy named default. Um, default is a special name. The default policy is applied implicitly whenever a string assignment happens. Um, and here I'm defining a, a default policy for URLs. So if the uh, URL starts with HTTP or HTTPS or mail to, um, or it doesn't have a protocol, which, uh, you know, according to that line noise, then it's allowed. Otherwise, it throws, uh, hopefully provides a, the developer with a message which tells them what went wrong and, and maybe how to, uh, to uh, uh, follow the approval process if what they're doing really is a legit case. Um, and with this, this assignment of an HTTPS URL just works. This assignment of a JavaScript URL fails. So we've been doing this for a while now for server-side XSS. Um, and uh, this is actually our main line of defense against XSS for some large, uh, high-profile applications like Gmail and Google+. Uh, here you can see we've got stats from our bug bounty program. Um, before, the, uh, before we started rolling out trusted types for server-side code, uh, the XSS rates were trending up for both applications. It took us a while to um, migrate these large applications, but as we did so, they dropped off. Um, and then after uh, migration, they've stayed low. So it's hard to come up with clear evidence of efficacy for a lot of security tooling, but this is, is highly suggestive. Um, and, uh, and yeah, this, we've implemented, we've, uh, we've gone and, and done this kind of widely throughout Google's internal stacks uh, for you know, half a dozen languages with protocol buffers kind of tying things together. Um, and so uh, to recap, if you control the CSP header, then Trusted Types gives you as a security practitioner the tools to uh, manage uh, DOM XSS. Um, and with trusted types enabled, trust decisions are, without trusted types enabled, um, trust decisions are implicit in their code. There's nothing about the code or the values that get assigned that indicate that these values were, that, that, that the code author intended to trust these values. With uh, trusted types enabled, uh, trust decisions are explicit and auditable. Um, since trusted types guard syncs, not only are trust decisions explicit, they're consistently checked before uh, values pass to things like the HTML parser or the JavaScript engine where uh, badness happens. Um, uh, 
with, uh, with whitelists, with policy whitelists, you can bound the amount of code that you as a member of the security team need to review. Um, these whitelists are very different from CSP whitelists, uh, CSP source whitelists. These whitelists tend to be smaller. Uh, they don't need to change when code is reorganized or bundled. Um, and uh, the, most of the things on these whitelists are a small number of kind of well under, tools with well understood security properties. Um, and what we found is that uh, using these whitelists allows us to guide developers towards safe abstractions and kind of incentivizes investment in, uh, in security engineering and, and uh, secure infrastructure. Um, and finally, the default policy and a few other mechanisms uh, are kind of pragmatic choices that we've found help to migrate applications to this scheme. And now, uh, Tristoff is going to show you how that works in practice. Yes, thank you. Okay, Mike. Um, sorry, I'm shorter than Mike. So, um, let's see some demo. All right, um, you can see the screen, yes. Um, so, there is an application. Uh, written in Angular framework that intends to, uh, you know, uh, it's an application in which you can search for videos, play them using various backend services like YouTube, SoundCloud, uh, Mixcloud. It's a reasonably complex application. It was written, uh, again, using Angular framework, run of the mill application, an exemplary one. So what we did is we took it and just migrated it to trusted types in a way that's safe, secure, and this is exactly what I will demonstrate, how to actually use the Trusted Types API in a real-world application. Of course, I can't show you Gmail right now, but, you know, something like that. Um, so, uh, you can later on even check out the code. It's, it's um, under my uh, GitHub repository in the web project, and Trusted Types-Angular branch has all the code. So, you can follow later on. First of all, Angular, the framework. Nowadays, JavaScript development, or at least for the modern applications, happens usually throughout the frameworks. Uh, there are a couple of popular ones, like React, Angular, Vue.js, uh, Polymer sometimes. And a lot of those frameworks already try to address the DOM access um, problem. They want to expose APIs to the developers that are safe by construction, or it's really hard to introduce vulnerabilities through them. Therefore, it is safe to assume that, for example, Angular, the framework, especially its, uh, let's say, the template rendering engine, is trusted to produce a trusted HTML value or trusted URL values. Why? Because Angular on its own has its HTML sanitizer inside. It has been reviewed for security. We know of no bypasses for now for, for that sanitization engine, so it's really you have to take an effort in your custom code in order to introduce an XSS vulnerability in an Angular application. Not AngularJS, Angular, the new one. Um, so what we did is we forked, an we have an experimental fork of the Angular framework, simply changing one component of it, making the sanitizer output the trusted values. And the only thing from the application user point of view uh, or the application author, is to, in the package JSON, just switch one of the um, uh, packages from Angular to our fork, right? So instead of using the core Angular um, or vanilla Angular, we're just using a fork, right? This is, this, is, this is all that it needs. And as long as the application only uses the Angular way of producing templates and interpolating user data into them, this should be safe because of the sanitizer that Angular uses. So let's try this in action. Spoiler alert, alert, it will not work. Let me actually zoom the thing. And what you can immediately see is something breaks here. Uh, this document requires a trusted HTML assignment. There's a couple of errors. But you can already see that this is something happening with jQuery. Apparently, this application not, not only uses Angular, it also uses jQuery. Thankfully, uh, we can see uh, where this actually breaks, right? So jQuery, when loaded, 
and jQuery is actually not loaded directly, it's loaded through one of the dependencies of the application, namely backbone.js. Uh, it does some DOM probing. Uh, it tries to uh, do some feature detection on DOM in order to, whatever, code workarounds. So how do we address this without changing jQuery itself? Which is possible, and I also did it, but this is not, not the part of this demo. Uh, well, we can use the default policy that Mike uh, told you about. Uh, the, the reason why this, uh, why this assignment failed is because uh, you know, we enforce the trusted types, allowing only three policies for this particular application. The one from, that Angular uses, the one that I will talk about later, and the default policy which I will enable right now. So let's enable this and the application will recompile in the meantime. And let's look at the default policy. So first of all, this application checks if the trusted types API is even available, if it is then it tries to create the, the policy name default, which is supposedly whitelisted in the header. And for this policy, <clears throat> if this policy is being called whenever strings are actually assigned to the DOM in the sensitive things, in this particular case, this function is called when HTML things are being called. And what I do here is I have some whitelist of HTML uh, that I simply allow to be written without rewriting the code. And this is exactly what jQuery does when loaded. It tries to insert those strings into the DOM. Clearly, this is not a DOM XSS. There's no you know, JavaScript payload in here or nothing user controlled. There's also something slightly more custom. They try to inject something that has a dynamic uh, here um, ID. But with, you know, with this regular expression being strict, I can make sure that actually there, there is no bypass that would enable for DOM XSS through this particular vector. So, this default policy is being called when, uh, when the strings are being assigned to the DOM XSS things, and that allows jQuery to work. On top of that, we have a couple of other things. First of all, there's a fallback case if you're trying to, well, essentially load new scripts to the page. And what I have here is also an allowed script regular expressions. There's some widget from YouTube, namely. All right. Thank you. Uh, there's a, a widget from YouTube uh, that is being loaded uh, from a URL that's somewhat predictable but still dynamic. Uh, and apart from that, what, are, what I do is I just console error just to surface to the developer, you know, you're doing something wrong. Like, the, you're loading an additional script. I know about this, uh, but I will allow for it for now, right? So I just return the input. Whenever you're using other URLs, URL things, what I do is just I parse the URL, and if you're just using HTTP or HTTPS, I really don't care. You can link to any arbitrary websites, like there's no DOM XSS involved here. Uh, and finally, if you want to use eval or other you know, friendly functions, I just disallow it, uh, at least when called with strings. And let's see how this thing works. Uh, the application actually reloaded, thanks to the modern development practices of it, but what we can see, uh, what is happening is, yeah, the whole application is working with trusted types under those policies. So we can, uh, whatever, look for OWASP, uh, try to, you know, click on the, oh, that's some, whatever, some, yeah, it plays music on my laptop. Now, so uh, you can see the application fully work, like nothing breaks. It was quite easy to migrate to trusted types. Uh, what we have right now is we bounded this application to only um, only the code that has access to those policies, uh, sorry, those from the index HTML. So only this one. So if you're using Angular, whatever Angular does, we trust it. Uh, and whatever default policy does, we trust it. In this particular case, you know, this whitelist of HTML, those, those other things. Uh, but let's see about this console error. What's going on? So. Oh, there's quite a lot of errors. Let me maybe clear it and refresh. <coughs> what you can notice is, yeah, please refactor, script URL. What's going on? Well, thankfully, this is all now part of the code. Like, the protection is part of your actual, actual code base, so we can just, you know, use regular um, debugging techniques, like, you know, just checking in the developer console. All right, so, yeah, indeed, there is something loading a Google Analytics script in some file in the application, and this one is using a string for, uh, for loading that script, which is potentially user controlled. You know, it, it's worth looking into. So let's look at this Google Analytics something something model.ts in the, in the source code. It's being <coughs> here, and we have it. However, 
Thankfully, by making the DOM API strongly typed, we can introduce language level checks or static analysis checks to uh, surface the vulnerabilities. And this is exactly what we did. We have a linter check that warns you that something potentially risky is going on. In this particular case, this resource URL assignment from string might result in script execution and will trigger trusted types violation at runtime. Use the literal policy, right? I mean, you obviously you know that the risk, the potential risk is you do something like this, right? Calculation href here or at the prefix, whatever. Like if there's something attacker controlled, then it's wrong. But we can offer fixes for it because, you know, static analysis, it sort of works now if we have types. So this is exactly what I did. And we are using this extra function that magically provides value and security. How does it work? Well, it works like that. As long as this function accepts a string literal, <coughs> that the assumption is the attacker cannot inject into the string literal. The attacker would, ha would need to have a server-side access in order to modify the actual JavaScript code. However, as soon as you want to, say, interpolate data into this, this is potentially attacker controlled, right? So if I use whatever location, sorry, uh, it's curly braces. If I use location, say, whatever, href or um, hash, right? Or slice one, the typical DOM accesses. <coughs> so as soon as you start interpolating into the string, you see that there is actually a problem, uh, a, a problem that even prevents compilation of this, uh, of this uh, code, which we will probably check after a couple of seconds here. Uh, why is that? Yeah, see, so the application, if you try to introduce, if you try to write, a, let's say, a dynamic string or a variable into a, a sensitive thing, this becomes a compilation error. So you get a pretty early feedback for the developer, something is wrong, you should be using a different method. Why is that? It's because this particular uh, function, it uses its own uh, policy called literal script URL, which supposedly does no validation. However, this policy is isolated in this particular module, right? Uh, in JavaScript modules, only the exported, <coughs> sorry, functions or objects are being able to, call, to be called externally. So, uh, this policy can only be used from within this module. And the only call side of it is this function, and this function has type annotations, some magic type scripts, uh, you know, type annotation thing, that makes sure that this behavior is preserved, meaning that only a string literal with no interpolation inside can be uh, the function argument. So even if we did, even if we did, sorry, uh, even if we did any expression here, this is also an error. So we can be reasonably sure that this is secure. And uh, given that this is a strongly typed, we are leveraging the typed system here, or uh, you know, a more strongly typed language like TypeScript-ish, uh, we can do even automatic refactoring for a lot of the call sites, which lets, which lets us migrate the application pretty easily. <coughs> so in the end, what happens uh, if we actually try to recompile the application using this thing, Did it succeed? Yes, it's compiled. Now, with the, now, this value, the Google Analytics script URL, is not actually, you're a good programmer and you're loading script from Google Analytics. This is part of this literal script policy uh, here, somewhere, yeah. So this value is not going through the default policy, and therefore by migrating your code or getting the warnings or errors through the default policy, you have a chance of migrating the, call, uh, the, the code, the risky code parts into more strict policies, the named policies, and then the default policy can be just like this, last resort, log only, report only, uh, or just throw if, if you're um, reason, reasonably sure all of the code has been migrated. So trusted type gives you a way of locking down the application in a way that is reviewable, auditable, um, and dramatically reduces the security surface. Because I know for sure right now, in this particular application, I don't have to review a single line of code that doesn't have access to the policy object. Because it cannot possibly introduce the DOM accesses. Because it would, all, it would only write a string to the DOM, and the strings are disallowed. The default policy would run there. Um, and I guess with that, I can go back to the presentation if everything works. Uh, and it doesn't, of course. 
An easier way, I would just restart the presentation. Mm -hmm. Oh, come on. Don't look at my password. It's a different one, amazing. Anyhow, this, the summary is the same, so we can just go here. So what's the status of the project? Uh, we have an implementation in Chrome for a couple of releases now. It changes uh, and you know we keep adding stuff to the API. You can use it using the origin trial. Uh, it's also created as a spec. This will go through the W3C uh, uh, you know, workflows. Uh, we have a discussion group where you can uh, you know, talk to us about using the API. There is a polyfill for other browsers. Um, the code is on GitHub. We are adopting this approach to Google applications. Uh, it works promisingly well uh, for now. Um, and in internally in Google, we have a whole team uh, working on adopting, creating uh, the API. Uh, and we're working on external integrations. DOM Purify is already integrated, so DOM Purify, if the Trusted Types API is available, will produce Trusted type, trusted HTML values, so you get the support for free. Uh, we have integrations with, with other libraries or frameworks plans. Uh, we integrate with TypeScript. There's a type definition um, um, package already. We do some trials with Angular, with React, and other frameworks. And we are set to release some secure policies libraries that offer <clears throat> not just a primitive of you know the security header and you can create your own policies. We will actually create policies that are safe and uh, are reviewed and we you know vouch for. Um, yeah, with that, I guess we can go to Q and A and let's end Dom Access together. Thank you. To this part. Uh, could you please compare it uh, with uh, CSP version 2 and using uh, unsafe eval? I, I mean, uh, duplicated on, on using unsafe eval in it for some web application. Uh, maybe it will be a little bit simpler way to prevent uh, DOM based access. Uh, CSP doesn't prevent access, it rather tries to mitigate the exploits that come from the access. We, we act more early, we, are, we try to prevent the injections in the first place instead of trying to make sure that the injections don't contain JavaScript is what CSP tries to uh, address. But in specific, <coughs> what, we, what we find CSP, after, after you know, years of experience, what we find CSP good at is it preventing or mitigating the server-side accesses, the stored and reflected in specific, especially the nonce-based variant of, of, C of CSP. However, um, for DOM accesses, it's just not best. Uh, I mean, we see a lot of... Um, DOM accesses ends up being a property of the JavaScript program, and you can't easily tune that by just... Mm, looking at the URLs of the scripts or maybe looking at eval only, right? So lack of unsafe eval in CSP can only make sure that you're not using eval. With trusted types, uh, you get to instruct eval what to, what to execute. So for example, um, it's way easier to migrate an application that uses eval selectively in some call sites to trusted types than it would be to remove the eval capability completely uh, that is required by CSP, sort of. So by using trusted types, you get more control into how your interactions with the DOM look like, including the eval function. So with CSP, it's more like it's binary thing, like, okay, so you can load scripts from this URL, or it needs to have a nonce, 
or you know you can use eval or you cannot use eval. It's a decision of the policy author. But at the same time, in safe eval, it's not it's not only about eval constructions, but in, it's about the, the whole constructions like in HTML and so on. So you can try simply not to include unsafe eval in your content security policy, uh, uh, and it will help you to mitigate uh, DOM based access. Isn't it true? Yes, CSP helps mitigate DOM XSS. That is, that is a true statement. It doesn't prevent the injections, though. And so, for example, uh, with, let's say, a hardened version of the CSP, you didn't remove the injection point. The attacker can still inject arbitrary HTML by ju by, and just you know, create a spoofing, uh, cre create a credential exfiltrating page. They can do it. There's no script there. It's just you know, graphics and a form field. And with trusted types, we try to prevent the injections, not the JavaScript execution from those injections. Okay, thank you. Thank you very right. much. Thank you, Christophe and Mike.